Now we're all in this together has become uh, a bit of an anthem. Although not for everyone, I am one of the 2.2 million people who were shielded. I'm also a trained epidemiologist, so I had a good idea of what might happen. I wasn't expecting the government to ignore the World Health Organization recommendations coming out of China. Surely they understand that viruses don't stop for airport security. Don't they know that days make a difference? Look, this is what happens with an infection like COVID-19. Well, this is what can happen. It's the 3rd of March. Boris is busy shaking hands with everyone. I've started stopping things I love doing, cancelling performances I was so excited to be part of. From Italy, Dr. Daniele Marcini reports that war has exploded. Be patient, he begs, when you can't go to the theatre or the gym. Try to have pity on the myriad of old people you could exterminate. Dr. Jason Van Schurt shares brutal details. Patients above 65 or with long-term conditions are not even assessed by intensive care staff. I'm not saying not ventilated, I'm saying not even assessed. 26 million people in the UK live with at least one long-term condition. 10 million, including me, have more than one. Are we worth nothing? Dr. Vanshaw gave some good advice. If the government won't help, at least keep your loved ones safe. UK officials might not have been listening, but I was. After I struggled in a panicking supermarket crowd, I went home and locked myself in. The Cheltenham Festival was approved and the Liverpool match. I couldn't help but think of the money-raising parades that spurred on the 1918 pandemic in America. Money versus lives, eh? I was finding it difficult to hope for the best, but I could and did prepare for the worst. I thought about my own funeral. Found a glorious woodland meadow site and a very cosy cocoon. But it's hard work deciding how you want to be buried. And even worse, thinking about your own dying. I felt exposed. I still feel so exposed. While Boris was out enjoying the rugby, I was inside, trying to hold onto a world which felt very far away. I could see the supermarkets were overwhelmed, and I was getting hungry. When you're not sure where or when your next meal is coming from, you get obsessed. There's no space in your head to think of anything else. Except I had to make space. One of my oldest friends went into ICU, and then... He died. Those graphs they keep showing us, it's like they don't know we're real people, actual fathers, actual sons, my neighbour's uncle, the man down the road's brother, somebody's mother, too many of somebody's mothers. We're not a herd to be harvested. Of course, I couldn't physically go to William's funeral. Live streaming meant, meant it was like the pallbearers were carrying the coffin right in my front room. I'm still, even now, stepping back and forth over that coffin. 23rd of March was the official UK lockdown. I got my shielding letter two weeks after I thought it was necessary. Maybe, I hoped, it might help with fresh food. It didn't. On the 25th of March, the first NHS doctor, Dr El Tayar, died. By the 8th of April, seven more doctors were dead, all Asian or black. Hospital deaths started stabilising, even falling. But care home deaths were surging. We are definitely not all in this together. 166 NHS staff died, 60% black or Asian. And 20,000 of our elders in care homes were left to die. Right now, we're supposed to be getting back to normal. Why do we want to get back to inequalities like these? I don't know what the second wave is going to be like. But the third wave, the huge wave of suffering and death that will follow on the inevitable recession, that will be the worst of all. More people will have worse long-term conditions 
inequalities could get even worse. As the pandemic started, impossible spending was somehow made possible. Let's make the impossible possible for inequalities too. <laughs>